Welcome to our video on core stability explained from the inside out. Inside out because that's where core stabilization begins. There has been a lot of emphasis placed on core stability and functional training by the fitness and healthcare industries. Unfortunately, there are also a lot of myths and misinformation out there too. I see a lot of people doing a variety of exercises that are supposed to deliver a strong core exercises that their trainer showed them. Maybe it was a gym friend or perhaps they saw it on YouTube. Some of these exercises that are supposed to be good for developing the core are crunches, planks, bridges, burpees, and Russian twists. All too often, exercises like these are simply getting people stronger what they're already doing wrong. They are reinforcing bad patterns and not building good ones. The truth is you'll never improve the function of your core if you cannot activate it in a way that is physiologically correct. Over the next few minutes, this video will review the functional anatomy of the core, how the core creates stability, and the relationship between posture, breathing, and core stabilization. So let's get started. We are often asked in the clinic, what is the core? Most people have heard of the core, but not very many people know what the core actually is. Fewer still know what the core does. To answer these questions, we'll start by discussing the anatomy of the core. I think the best way to understand what the core is and how it functions is to think of it as a canister. The diaphragm forms the top of the canister. The pelvic floor muscles sit at the bottom. And lastly are the muscles of the abdominal wall, which are the internal and external obliques and the transversus abdominis muscle. It is important to remember that the abdominal muscles wrap all the way around from front to the back to form the wall of the canister. At the back, the abdominals blend into a very dense sheet of connective tissue called the thoracolumbar fascia. The gluteus maximus and the latissimus dorsi also blend into this fascia, connecting the shoulders and hips to the core. As you will see later in this video, the thoracolumbar fascia plays a key role in spinal stabilization. We will now move on to what is the most overlooked component of the core, the diaphragm. The diaphragm sits below the lungs, separating the thoracic and abdominal cavities. It is a strong muscle that attaches to the spine and lower ribs at the bottom and has a large central tendon at the top. Did you know that the diaphragm has three functions? Most people know that the diaphragm functions during respiration, allowing us to inhale. We'll discuss normal and abnormal breathing patterns in just a bit. Did you know the diaphragm also has a sphincter function? It prevents stomach acid from backing up into the esophagus. People with gastroesophageal reflux, or GERD, are typically quite unstable and breathe abnormally. So if someone with acid reflux wants to fix this problem, a problem that can lead to esophageal cancer, they must change the way their diaphragm functions. Lastly, and more in keeping with the topic of this video, is the diaphragm's role in core stabilization. The diaphragm is definitely the most overlooked component of core stability. It is impossible to have adequate core stabilization if the diaphragm does not function correctly. Sometime between three and four months of age, the infant's central nervous system learns to coordinate the diaphragm with the abdominal wall and pelvic floor to create core stability. This is when the diaphragm switches from being a purely respiratory muscle to participating in stabilization too, and it can perform either one or both functions at the same time based on demand. We'll discuss this more later on. Carol Levitt, one of the greatest contributors to modern manual medicine, once said, If someone's breathing pattern is not normal, none of their other movement patterns can be. The reason for this is simple. The way in which someone breathes is the way in which they stabilize. The quality of their stabilization dictates the quality of their movements. It makes sense, then, that if we are trying to improve someone's core stability, we must first correct the way they breathe. So what does a physiologically normal breathing pattern look like? During normal respiration, the diaphragm descends in the thorax by pulling the central tendon down towards its origin at the spine and the lower ribs. The rib cage should expand but does not lift. The spine and pelvis remain neutral. 
The neck, shoulder, chest, and back muscles all remain relaxed, and there is a 360 degree expansion of the abdomen. It must be stressed that this is not belly breathing. People who have chronic complaints of neck or back pain, problems with their shoulders, hips, or knees, typically have an abnormal respiratory pattern too. Quite often, we find when people with chronic musculoskeletal pain inhale, their back goes into extension and the rib cage lifts towards their head. This is called a paradoxical respiratory pattern. Essentially, during inspiration, the diaphragm moves in the opposite direction that it is supposed to. This causes the neck, chest, and back muscles to tighten with each and every breath they take, which is about 25,000 times per day. We often find the rib cage is flared, the abdomen is hollowed, the pelvis is tilted forward, and the back rests in extension. Does it make sense for someone's neck, shoulders, and back to be moving with each and every breath they take? This pattern is also associated with a weak core and is an indicator of instability. Now that we have a better understanding of what the core is, the next question we will cover is, what does the core actually do? How does the core create stability? Core stability begins with being able to generate and regulate intra-abdominal pressure. The image on the left depicts the diaphragm functioning like a piston within a cylinder. As the diaphragm descends, a negative pressure or vacuum builds in the thorax, allowing air to enter the lungs. At the same time, the descending diaphragm is also causing a positive pressure to build in the abdominal cavity. This positive pressure is called intra-abdominal pressure. The figure on the right is showing the same thing, only the abdominal wall is not fixed and rigid like, like the cylinder wall on an engine. As intra-abdominal pressure increases, it is pushing outward in all directions, causing the abdominal wall to stretch. The abdominal wall does not simply stretch passively like an inflating balloon. It is contracting eccentrically against this stretch without hollowing to increase intra-abdominal pressure even more when necessary. Intra-abdominal pressure causes two things to happen. First, as the pressure builds, it pushes backward against the lumbar spine like a support brace. Second, as the abdominal wall tightens, it loads the thoracolumbar fascia in the back. Loading the fascia also braces the spine by pulling it forward. So intra-abdominal pressure produces opposing braces for the spine from the front and from the back. There's a third mechanism by which the core provides spinal and pelvic stability. This comes from the internal and external obliques that attach directly to the pelvis and rib cage. This creates a physical bridge, much like guy wires holding the thorax upright on the pelvis. So we have three mechanisms that the core provides stability. There is intra-abdominal pressure represented by blue pushing back against the spine. The stretching and contracting abdominal wall loading the thoracolumbar fascia that pulls the spine forward shown in green. Lastly, the guy wire effect of the oblique abdominals in red. This intra-abdominal pressure based stabilization mechanism does not function only during breathing. MRI studies have shown us that when the body has to stabilize under a load, the diaphragm descends the very same way, even in the absence of breathing. Take lifting a heavy weight, for example. The diaphragm automatically descends to stabilize the spine and pelvis, as previously described, when it is under a load. The greater the load, the more the diaphragm descends. So, as the need for stabilization increases, more intra-abdominal pressure has to be created. To do this, the diaphragm will descend a little further and the abdominal wall tightens a little more too. Under a minimal load, like sleeping on your back, when the need for stabilization is negligible, the diaphragm functions almost solely in its respiratory role. However, as the need for stability increases, the diaphragm shifts its function towards stabilization and the ability to breathe begins to diminish. 
Under maximal load, such as lifting a very heavy weight, the diaphragm is performing purely a stabilization function. Here, the diaphragm is maximally descended to produce as much intra-abdominal pressure as possible and breathing becomes almost impossible. This is how the central nervous system regulates intra-abdominal pressure. Ideally, one should not have to consciously orchestrate all these events. It is designed to be automatic. For people who are unstable, have poor posture, or do not breathe correctly, this automaticity only comes with training. What are the effects when this system does not function ideally? What happens when the body uses a different strategy to stabilize with? There are several signs that we look for while performing a physical exam that are indicators of what strategy someone is using for stability. The posture of the abdomen, is it rounded and full or is it hollowed and drawn in? The shape and position of the rib cage, is it correctly held in an expiratory position or is it lifted and flared? Is the spine in a neutral posture or is the pelvis tilted forward and the back in extension? Are the diaphragm and pelvis parallel to each other? Are the back muscles relaxed or are they tight and overdeveloped? Does the person have a normal respiratory pattern or are they chest and neck breathers? These are all signs of a compensatory stabilization strategy, one that is very ineffective. This information provides clues to the underlying cause of their physical complaints. When evaluating the human body, it is important to keep in mind that everything is interconnected. Nowhere does a body part function in isolation. Muscles are linked together to form fascial lines. Joints are linked to form a kinetic chain. A localized problem somewhere in the body causes compensations to occur along these fascial lines of muscle and kinetic chains of joints. Compensation causes tissue strain and eventual tissue failure. Over time, an injury occurs. This is the most common underlying cause of a myriad of physical ailments that plague modern society. This is the underlying cause of conditions like arthritis, tendinitis, and disc herniations that take years to develop. This is why it is important to evaluate physical complaints with an eye for symptoms versus causes. There are an endless number of conditions or physical complaints that someone may be seeking help for. It is necessary to identify the structure that is causing their symptoms, and there are a number of different techniques, some better than others, that can be used to help people feel better and move more freely. However, symptom-based treatment is limited. Symptoms are not causes. Symptoms are warning signals that something is wrong. Symptoms are the little light on the dashboard telling you that you have a problem. To be better, and there is a big difference between feeling better and being better, we must identify and correct the underlying cause, the reason why those structures are generating symptoms. Most often, the underlying cause is related to a combination of instability, dysfunctional patterns, and bad postural habits. We are here to help you meet your treatment goals. Whether you are simply looking for relief from whatever symptoms are ailing you, or to correct the underlying cause and improve your overall well-being, our job is to be here for you, whatever direction you choose. Thank you for allowing us to be part of your healthcare team.